News First News Line with Faraz Shaukatali. A very good evening to you and welcome to Newsline Zoom. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, thanks to the uh, various things that's happening with uh, CV-19, the pandemic, um, Newsline has uh, also been forced to take the appropriate precautions. So we are doing this uh, interview by using latest technology and everyone's familiar, excepting me. Uh, it's called Newsline Zoom. And uh, to, uh, this evening on Newsline Zoom is a guest who is no stranger to our network um, and, uh, in fact, no stranger to uh, all of you, the Republic of Sri Lanka. He is, of course, none other than um, author, uh, former parliamentarian, former minister, and uh, very well read, and um, uh, delights in uh, representing uh, the interests of Sri Lanka. The one, the only, the very inimitable, and today the windswept, um, the village look, Professor Rajiv Vijay Singer. Good evening to you, Professor. Good evening, Faraz. Nice to see you after a very long time. You're looking just the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I've lost a bit of weight, actually. Now, now then, Professor Vijay Singer, what is, uh, do you think, in your view, that the government is doing everything uh, as much as they can do uh, in terms of um, the economy and coping with the pandemic? Well, I think they're probably doing as much as they can do in the sense that rather sad think we are talking of a rather unprofessional government. So I don't think they really can do anything else because it needs a greater degree of professionalism and discipline in order to take the measures that this country really requires. I mean, it's been quite disappointing because we actually thought when Gota Rajpaksa was elected that he would bring to bear professionalism and discipline. And I'm afraid these are lacking. So we now have a series of ad hoc responses and some confusion. And of course, you know, we have to sympathize because they have been hit by a pandemic such as uh, the world hasn't really experienced before for a very long time. But uh, I think the net result is a great sense of disappointment, if not anger, on the part of many people. And uh, I'm afraid I really don't see where we can go for honey, as my grandmother used to put it. Uh, well, um, going for honey would, uh, would appear to be the only place left, really, uh, would appear to be the IMF. But why is there such uh, a fright about, uh, IMF, about going to the IMF, uh, almost like though the IMF is some sort of bogeyman? Well, I have, I have absolutely no idea. I mean, I'm not in the higher echelons of government. I don't know who makes the decisions. All I can say is that, uh, you know, probably uh, my advice would be as good as any that's now being given to the government. Whereas what you really need is much greater levels of professionalism. And I don't see that happening at all. It's very sad. I don't know who's there to guide them. I don't know who's providing assistance and advice that it's obviously not the right people. Uh, go, going to the IMF, uh, uh, would you believe that it will um, bring up uh, issues which this government isn't entirely fond of? Um, you know, the whole accountability process and uh, the UN and Geneva and all that business. Well, I mean, I, I have no idea, but I do know that really part of the problem is that uh, fiscal discipline is lacking. But I think we also know that fiscal discipline is quite possible without much great suffering for people, provided that there's fiscal discipline internally. You know, one thing I've been doing, you know, I've been spending a lot of time studying the past. I could just see the same things happening under Jaya Jawabne, who opened up the economy. And then within a few years, we were facing disaster and Ronnie Devel had to go cap in hand. But actually, the recommendations at the time made by people like uh, Neville Karnatilak, who subsequently became governor of the Central Bank, even Esmond Vikramasinghe, who understood economics much more than his son Ranil, was to actually have a bit of a change and there was need for discipline. But what Jair was doing in order to keep his power was allowing all his ministers to run right. And, you know, we've seen it now, I mean, the extraordinary assertion that 
expensive cars were to be given. And I think you had, uh, I forget his name, uh, Godahaver, saying, you know, he really needed a very expensive car because he had to travel a lot, even while the government was trying to impose COVID restrictions, you know, we're in cloud cuckoo land. But we've been there before. The 80s were quite bad as well. And it required the sort of discipline that Prem Rasa tried to impose, which he couldn't really do properly, to actually, you know, have new economic policies, people-friendly economic policies that would take things forward. I don't see any of that emerging now, which is very sad because you would have thought the Rajapaksas would have understood the need for better rural development. Their father did. They had and uh, um, Professor Raju, talk, talking about uh, discipline and uh, having a disciplined government, um, this whole business of uh, uh, our president, uh, Gotabi Rajapaksa, uh, leaning towards the military for, to do all sorts of uh, things in the ministries, ministry secretaries and so on, retired officers uh, maybe indeed, but um, and including the uh, the uh, KNDU bill uh, to try and do all that, it, it's all about trying to instill a disciplined society. Do you think that's the right way to go using the military? Well, as you as you know perfectly well, discipline has to be, begin at home. And when the country at large feels that the government is not very disciplined, you can't expect them to follow suit. So I think you really have to have much more careful behavior than government is engaging in. Now, I think the real problem is that poor Gotabe Rajpaksa is suffering from the disease created by Jayajawad, which also laid Mahinda low. And that is to assume that the solution for a problem is another election that you can win. You may or may not recall for us that when I ran for president, not expecting to win, of course, uh, but I think it's rapidly becoming clear that I would have done a better job than most of the others around. Um, I actually pointed out that whoever became president had to act immediately, you know, engage in the reforms that were needed. The sort of reform that Mahindra Rajapaksa pledged in 2010 and then forgot about. As you know, I'm very proud that I wrote to him in 2014 saying, please do what you promised, otherwise I can't support you. So I, I, you know, I gave him fair notice. And what Gotabe should have done was immediately brought in all the reforms, including electoral reforms, but he frittered away eight months in trying to get a massive majority. And what has he done with it? It's really very, very sad. It's all falling apart. And if he'd done what he promised in 2018 and he came in on an enormous wave of goodwill, I think we would be in a much better position, but nothing, nothing happened for three months. So, so are you saying that uh, we would be fab had he kept his word? Well, I think he'd done a lot of things that he seemed to be ready to do. You know, just look at the situation. He had a streamlined cabinet to begin with. That was good. He did engage in rather ridiculous tax cuts, which I realized the income de tax department was not consulted about, you know, which has led to one of our problems. Because as you know, with pay gone, WHT gone, the cash flow has you know, diminished. And we now all wait for people to fill in their tax returns at various moments. But of course, uh, many people who, you know, the pensioners who lived on W on uh, withholding, paid their withholding tax, many of them don't even pay now. And by the time they're caught up, it will be terrible. So there's a lot of real little blunders, but they all add up. And uh, Professor Vijay Singh, uh, would you say that um, um, Sri Lanka is going to, uh, as a result of the uh, mismanagement and indisciplined uh, nature of governance, uh, that Sri Lanka is going to have to hobble along for the next three years? Is that what, uh, what's, uh, is that what's going to happen? Well, yes. I mean, you know, the one thing that I think we all have to remember is that the mess was also created by the last government. And then, because Maitripala was so uh, feckless, and because Sajid Premadas and Karuja Asturya were absolute cowards and didn't take steps to get rid of their idiot leader, we were left in this terrible position so that, you know, the decline went further and further. 
I mean, the same went for Mahindra Rajapaksa, having done a magnificent job in his first term. He then lost interest. And as you know, things went slowly downhill. But because he'd done so well, the decline in 2013 and 14 wasn't so obvious. But then in 2015, when that government did nothing of what he promised, and then, you know, stole the central bank, the decline was colossal. And in all fairness to go to Abe Rajapaksa, he inherited a mess. But then, you know, that's why he got such a large majority. Everyone expected him to act straight away and not produce the mixture as before. And now we have the same sad situation again. And, you know, one of the saddest things about Sri Lanka is we never study our past. You know, it was ironic that, uh, you know, take what's happening in, uh, in uh, Geneva now. We've been doing rather badly, not just recently, but for the last nine years. And no one has bothered to look at how well we did from 2007 to 2009. So, you know, I've just produced a book on that, which actually shows that we worked on the slogan that the Secretary of Defense made famous, we help ourselves. And then what you have now, I can't even believe it's true, but I'm told that the present Secretary of Defense has claimed that we were saved in Geneva because the Chinese employed their veto. I couldn't really believe that because, as you know, in the Human Rights Council, there isn't a veto. And the Chinese, who were very, very helpful, actually worked on the strategy Dan Jatelik had developed to build up a rock solid majority, which included a lot of other good friends, some of whom we managed to alienate. Incredibly sad. This is the book I was talking about. I mean, ironically, this just came out last uh, week when this absurd thing happened. It's called Representing Sri Lanka. And it shows this enormously successful group who totally sidetracked the efforts of the West to move a motion against us in uh, 2007 September. And then we threw that advantage away for us. Very sad. And uh, Professor Vijay Singh, how important is our international relationships um, uh, currently when we are facing a uh, absolute economic mess, really? Well, I think it's very important to have good relations. I, I really cannot understand how we failed to have anybody in India for nearly two years. I was quite pleased that Milinda Moragoda, who's supposed to be going there now, not an intelligent chap, didn't, uh, you know, do anything much in the last two years. God knows what he was doing. Someone said he was producing a paper. I mean, if you take two years to produce a paper, there's something wrong with you. But he did do something very good a couple of days ago. His Pathfinder organization, which is supposed to have a lot of influence, I don't know. I mean, John the Colombagais was part of that, who's now foreign secretary. He actually had a chat with Lord Maysby. And, you know, I cannot understand why we haven't worked with people like Lord Maysby. You know, I could understand Mangala Samarina and Ranil Vikramasinghe treating Nesby with contumely because they wanted to do the country down. But, you know, when, when Nesby produced the GASH reports, he sent them to me to give Mahindra Rajapaksa. And I gave, I, Mahindra actually came and collected them the day I told him to and then did nothing. And when I asked him, he said, Ah, oh, Mandri, you'll be this good. I said, I think I'll be right tomorrow, not our side. Maitri Pala Sirisenas twice claimed he didn't get the reports. So we didn't take forward the brilliant work Lord Naseby had done on behalf of Sri Lanka. We didn't take forward the superb work Desmond De Silva and the Paranagama Commission did. We didn't take forward the superb work the Udalagama Commission did. So we were left without a defense. And of course, you know, it's going to affect us economically as well because there'll be all sorts of excuses now. And uh, on that note, uh, let's go for a short break and have a little peek at uh, this evening's uh, headlines from the News First uh, Primetime News. We'll see you on the other side of the break. And welcome back to Newsline Zoom. We are in conversation by Zoom uh, with uh, Professor Rajiv Vijay Singer, 
uh, who's all windswept and uh, talking to us from the outskirts. Um, the village look, I'm told. Now then, uh, Professor Vijay Singer, your book, what is the focus of your book? What is it? Is it uh, to do with Geneva and so on? Well, it is really about Geneva. It sets down in detail the strategy really developed by the Anja Tilaka, implemented fantastically by Mahinda Samra Singer, who was an excellent minister at the time and someone who absolutely studies his briefs and looks for expertise. You know, I mean, one tragedy is that uh, under his aegis, we developed a National Human Rights Action Plan, which simply wasn't fulfilled. If we'd fulfilled it, we wouldn't have all this trouble we're having now, you know, all this talk about what's happening to women and children, these horrible instances of what, amongst other things, Rishad Badiuddin seems to have been up to. All that, we had a very good plan, we had a wonderful chair of the National Child Protection Agency, Anuma Disanayaka, and there's been no one like her since. I had to do some work with her successors, and none of them cared desperately for children. Now, all that went by the board. The prisons, you know, Gotabe started by saying how he wanted to reduce the prisons. It's all there in our human rights action plan about stopping custodial sentencing. All these were done. We developed it. Um, I mean, I chaired the committee under Mahinda Samra Singer. And then, of course, idiotically in 2010, government abolished the Human Rights Ministry. They said they were giving it to the Foreign Ministry. The Secretary Ramesh Chai Singer said they're not equipped to deal with it. Human rights was not taken further. And it would have been so easy because we had our own homegrown solutions. But now, because we did nothing, the so-called international community says, and you can understand why they're saying it, well, we'd better step in. I mean, they shouldn't step in, but to stop them stepping in, we can't stay, bleat about sovereignty. We have to establish that human rights is about our people. None of that was done. So anyway, we, we did a hell of a lot. I mean, there were things like, you know, when I was to the minister, I tried to have counseling. Uh, when I tried to have counseling in 2009 in Manic Farm, I was told, no, 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 people get the impression that we traumatized them. And I said, but, you know, trauma happens in war. We're not saying we're guilty because we're trying to deal with it. Nothing was done then. So a lot of the things that we should have done then and which we can still do are in this book. But, of course, one of the things that I've realized is that no one in Sri Lanka really looks at the past. I remember when I ran the degree course, uh, academic side of it at the Deirdre Military Academy, I said, why aren't we studying our failures in war? And they said, well, we can't because the people who failed are now in, at the top of the army. But in India, you know, after they blundered, uh, this was in 2002 or three, I hasten to add. Yeah. In India, when the IPKF had a disaster, there were about 17 books analyzing why they failed. We did nothing of the sort. So no wonder we keep floundering. You know, there's no sense of learning. The same thing happens with education. I don't know whether you follow the controversy about should we have English medium, should we have English medium? Someone who was one of the worst ministers of education we had said, you can't do it, it's illegal. He obviously doesn't understand what the constitution says. So the other thing I've done, I mean, I've written a lot in this last time. It's been interesting to look at the past. And my other book that came out two weeks ago as well is this one. It's about initiatives in English for education, schools, universities, vocational training. And again, you know, I thought that Abhay Rajapaksa had a good idea in having one full Minister of Education to handle everything. But there's been no coherence since. We've been upsetting the teachers unnecessarily. We haven't in 2000 taken the steps that would have been so easy to promote education in a context in, many, in which many people don't have connectivity. You know, we work in terms of bubbles, like we used to do for the old Gelt course. Yeah. And all this has done, I don't know whether you realized it, but did you know that the Ministry of Women and Children is under the Ministry of Education? Someone obviously blundered. It was a good move, perhaps, to put early childhood education under education. But then they put the whole of the package which is about protecting women and children, comes under the Ministry of Education. What incoherence. Um, would you say that as a result of these moves, like uh, listing the uh, agency under the Ministry of Education, 
Um, do you believe that such moves have only added to the problems uh, being faced by women and children in this country? Yes, I mean, it's incoherent, it's ad hoc. You know, one of the reasons I, I uh, went against my Rajapaksa is there was an Education Act. Do you know, do you know this country functions still on the 1930s education ordinance? We've tried to have an act. It was destroyed, although there was a good draft in 2010. S.P. Sanak and his very good secretary, now head of the uh, NIE, had a new act that wasn't put forward because it was delayed in the legal draftsman's department. The Vocational Training Act that I prepared when I was head of the TVC, the Higher Education Act I prepared when I was minister, with a lot of input, were completely ignored by my successors. Because no one is interested in policies. No one is interested in laying down frameworks. It's all ad hoc. Any minister who comes in, you know, we're going to have a cabinet reshuffle next week. So they say, the first thing that will happen is the minister will say, you know, my predecessor was an idiot. I will now tell you what to do. And he won't even bother to see what his or her predecessor did. So, you know, we have this extraordinary system of unprofessionalism. Um, it started really you know, under Jaya Jaya Walker with this mad cabinet, but no one had dared to change it. And I thought Gotabe would, and he hasn't. And, and in your view, uh, Professor Vijay Singh, what is the problem? Is the problem that uh, the president is being stymied in his efforts to uh, pursue better governance by uh, the prime minister's uh, so-called merry men? I have no idea. You know, everyone says, you know, the brothers are pulling in different directions. I don't think so. I think that first loyalty is always to each other. But I think the problem behind it is that the president who should take the lead and, you know, Mahindra Rajapaksa would not object, should then work with professionals, not just pick up any Tom, Dick and Harry, who, uh, you know, happens to be able to do a political favor. So the result is we don't have enough professionals um, in, fi in uh, finance, we don't have enough professionals in education, we don't have enough professionals in foreign affairs, and we had no training mechanisms to make things better. We have to start with the schools, but all the work I did about soft skills for students, no one has bothered to do it. I mean, I still go back to the, the, the life skills syllabus I produced when I headed the NI Academic Affairs Board in 2004. Cambridge University Press in India said, these are fantastic syllabus, can we produce the textbook for it? The new people that came in threw it aside and went back to rote learning. The, the government when uh, they say that they are spending or allocating 6% towards education, uh, A, is it adequate? And are they really spending 6%? Because others have come on the show say that they're only spending about 2%. No, I don't think they're spending 6%, but the real problem is they're spending it all wrong. You see, I mean, look at the way in which schools are administered. So the great deal that goes waste. Look at the amount spent in new buildings. Look at the failure to address the question of how to use this plant well. For instance, schools are empty all day. Why don't we set up, when I was Minister of Higher Education, I actually in, produced a cabinet paper to start giving free English and computer classes in one divisional center in every single uh, uh, in every division, uh, education division in the country. Nothing followed up. The plant continues to be wasted. In 2014, when we got lots of computers and they built nanosellers on which a lot of people made a lot of money, they didn't open them because they were waiting for politicians to come and open them before the elections. And of course, as you know, computers get spoiled if they're not used. There were nanosellers with nothing happening. So there's no solid administrative system We've been talking for ages about abolishing educational zones and giving more power to educational divisions. Nothing's been done about it. We've been talking about ages. For, uh, you know, Mike Palacician has talked about making the division the service delivery point for the whole country. Nothing was done about that. The proposals that I put forward with you and help, uh, unfortunately, we got the first step going. And then Mr. Abekun, who was secretary at the time, said, no, 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 then Chandetian, I think, up in Avatamu. 
Then he forgot all about it. So the planning doesn't happen. No wonder they are in this. So uh, just as we conclude then, uh, Professor Vijay Singh, uh, uh, what we're lacking then is a commitment to a real plan for progress. Well, we don't have planning. I still remember in 2009, December, no, yeah, uh, the then Secretary of the Ministry of Planning and I did a paper on enhancing the role of policy and plan implementation, the ministry. And we gave it to Mahindra Rajapaksa just before it's elected president. What was the answer? They abolished that ministry. There has not been a Ministry of Policy and Plan Implementation since then. It has been combined with economic affairs, whether it's under Ranil, Vassil, or whatever. And that's wrong because you don't put the uh, the person implementing something to monitor what he's implementing. You have to have a separate institution. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rajiv Singh, for your time uh, on Newsline Zoom. And that's the way it was on uh, Newsline this evening. And uh, we'll see you again uh, with an equally interesting guest tomorrow evening. Same time, same place. In the meantime, take care and God bless you. News first, Newsline with Faraz Shaukar.